Now, as the Israel Hamas war rages on, the World Bank has warned that it may trigger global economic shocks. In the meantime, Africa is still grappling with the aftermath of the pandemic and the impact of the Russia Ukraine war. Now, the Israel Hamas war adds another layer of risk to the continent's reliance on commodities and has implications for broader geopolitical landscape. Everesto Berenia, who's associate professor of African politics in the Department of Political Sciences at the University of South Africa, joins us to discuss this in greater detail. Prof, thank you for your time and good afternoon. Ooh, Prof, I think you're thank you for having me. Wonderful, Prof. Thank, thank you for having me and good afternoon, yes. Wonderful, Prof. Let's talk about what we are seeing there uh, in the Middle East. Uh, perhaps it's important for us to first understand if what we've seen uh, to date acts mm -hmm. as a shock uh, for the African continent, very similar to the shock that we might have seen with the pandemic or even the Russia-Ukraine war. This is a huge shock, not only because of what is happening in Gaza, but also if you look at the compounded and the bigger picture, there are three wars that are being fought in three continents. There is a war in Sudan, there is a war in Europe between Russia and Ukraine. As if those two wars were not enough, there is now another war in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. So the international arena is completely volatile, it's so unpredictable, and there is so much insecurity from a human perspective to an energy security. These uh, unpredictable and predictabilities for us in Africa are being also made worse by the series of coups that we experienced in the Sahel region. So this is uncharted waters both in Africa and also globally. Mm, Prof, I want to get into uh, how this affects the African continent and even where, what, how we might be uh, trying to digest this. But when we speak of, for instance, the coups, when we speak of the volatility, when we speak of the three different balls, three different continents, what do we call this? Deglobalization, fragmentation, uh, you know, how do we uh, pin exactly uh, what we're seeing happening around the world? This is a very difficult phenomenon to characterize, not only because it is a new phenomenon, but most importantly because it is a moving target. So let's agree that we are seeing the creation of a new world order. We are seeing countries of the global south that were the smaller players in the international arena beginning to stand up to the so-called big powers. We saw South Africa taking up Israel at the World Court and South Africa came 15-2 victorious if we were to put that on a score line. But the war again <clears throat> is not only having repercussions in in Gaza and Israel, it is having uh, repercussions domestically. The American upcoming elections are going to be determined but by what happens Israel and Hamas. Europe today, look at Germany. What is happening in Germany is a response to the war in Ukraine. Look at all those farmers that are driving their tractors from the farms and packing them on the highways as a way of demonstrating the import of cheap commodities from Ukraine into their countries. So the wars are not just dividing the world. They are dividing the West. They are even dividing domestic politics, and Poland is a typical example where Polish, um, the Poles are beginning to say, hang on, what is the cost to us of hosting Ukrainian refugees? And there's a lot of stigma that is beginning to accrue there. And the bottom line is that these wars are proving to be very costly, not just from an energy perspective, but also from an emotional and a security perspective. Now, Prof, then I want to bring it back home to South Africa, because I mean to Africa and the African continent, because of course, what we are also seeing here in Africa, and this is us trying to get, for instance, the African uh, free continental trade area going, where ourselves on the continent are a little bit, uh, you know, um, fragmented in terms of what we see happening uh, in Gaza. We have, uh, for instance, uh, countries like South Africa and Algeria that have, of course, uh, picked a side here and gone in the direction of the Palestinians. But we have other countries uh, such as Kenya and Ghana who are, have a good, strong ties with Israel and seem to be leaning in that direction. And there may be countries like Nigeria, which are in the middle. And that tells me that we're not agreeing either. I'm wondering if it's necessary for us to agree on what happens here and what it means for us not to agree. 
Africa has never spoken with one voice. We have never acted in our own interest. You look at what happened at the Pan-African Parliament, where we were supposed to vote in the best interest of Africa, but we were divided into three blocks, Francophone Africa, Lusophone Africa, and Anglophone Africa. If you look at the International Criminal Court, there are some African countries that are saying Africa must resign in mass. Others are saying it's a good court that is doing a bad job. Others are saying we are happy with what the International Criminal Court is. If you look at how Africa voted at the United Nations General Assembly when the Russia-Ukraine war was beginning to 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 do, do hit up. It demonstrates the same picture. So, so what am I pushing it? I'm pushing at the fact that Africa has never been independent to act in its own best interest. We act out of fear, not out of love. We fear the consequences that may accrue if we go against Israel. We are afraid of the consequences that will accrue if we go against the United States. And the United States has never shied away from demonstrating its ability to discipline those countries that go against it in the international order. So African countries are not acting in their best interest, but they are acting out of the fear of being punished by the global powers, especially the United States, especially the European Union. So what we are seeing in terms of the support that African countries are giving or not giving to Israel or Palestine is in most cases not out of a rational, considered democratic thought processes, but it is out of political consideration that if we go against Israel, we may have a lot of investment pulled out. We may have our country grey listed and so on and so on. So we are not yet in a position to act in our best interest as Africa. With that said, Prof, we know that the United States has launched a new bill. Uh, the Biden administration looking to review uh, their uh, relations with South Africa. Could you say that something like that could materialize because of the assertion that we've made, which is obviously uh, pro-Palestine at this point? There is um, a lot of debate in the United States, especially among its um, 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 uh, senators, as to what should uh, be done by the United States in response to the situation that South Africa caused because the United States was of the view that South Africa was not supposed to do that. Now that South Africa went ahead and did it and that the International Criminal Court ruled in favor of South Africa, the United States feels compelled to act and by this I mean to retaliate. And Americans are bemoaning the fact that this happened after the negotiations of the AGOA, the Africa Growth with Opportunity Act. Otherwise South Africa was going to be punished through being removed from the list of beneficiary countries. We saw Uganda was removed as a result of its legislation which went against is the LGBTIQ people. But that being said, th there's nothing stopping the United States Congress from enacting new legislation or even a presidential decree that punishes South Africa. And this could be uh, in the form of um, the removal of the withdrawal of certain benefits, certain um, certain um, uh, b b partnerships and um, funds that the United uh, States was giving to South Africa. We know that we are uh, one of the hugest recipients of, of PEPFA, and we have got a lot of partnerships going on through the USID programs. So that could be a soft target for the United States to use, not only to punish South Africa, but to send a clear message to all other countries in the global South that, hey, if you do like what South Africa did, this is what will befall you. Remember the lesson that uh, the the collective West method on Zimbabwe. If you take land, we will withdraw your currency. Even if you are one of the biggest gold producers in the world, you will be a country without a currency. So the United States will certainly use this opportunity to make a case. My prof, we don't have much time left, but I must ask you here, you're speaking about a new world order, uh, you know, a much more risky global environment. Uh, what kind of leadership should we be looking here, especially when you look at, it's an election year, you know, uh, people may have uh, a chance to think anew about where the world is going, what Africa should be thinking about for itself. This is a very difficult one because in the United States, we've got two old men that are vying for the for the for the White House. Um, Biden is no longer the youngest and Donald Trump has got his own issues. So so uh, so the, the the elections in the United States certainly will 
will show us which direction the globe will be will be going if you push me for a prediction i will certainly say donald trump will not be removed from the ballot donald trump will contest the elections and my view is that donald trump is going to win the elections and when donald trump win the election what does it mean for the war in russia given his alleged coziness with russia given the fact that he is a mkwenyana of the ukrainians remember his wife melania is from ukraine so this is a very tricky one he is quoted as having said that if he's elected into office he will end the russia ukraine war in 48 hours and some say this is why the general was fired by president zelensky mm -hmm. because he had dared to say let's prepare for a scenario where donald trump is the president and he orders the war to stop let's just have that scenario at the back of our mind and the political establishment in kiev was not happy and the general was fired and replaced this will also have huge implications for the war in israel unfortunately we do not have enough time maybe mm -hmm. we should carry this discussion on at another time Fantastic, Prof. Always a pleasure hearing from you. Thank you so much for your thoughts and insights. It's always a pleasure uh, speaking to you. That was uh, Evaristo Banyere from the UNISA's Department of Political Sciences. Mm -hmm.